Watching New York Attorney General Letitia James and Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis go to war with former President Trump has been revealing. It appears that black Americans led by black women are the only ones courageous enough to hold the former president's feet to the fire for the alleged crimes he has committed. The infamous mugshot of inmate P01135809 would not be a reality without District Attorney Fonnie Willis's investigation into former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election and award the state of Georgia's electoral college votes to himself. Letitia James and Fonnie Willis's courageousness compelled me to think of Ruby Friedman and Shea Moss, the two election workers targeted by former President Trump and Rudy Giuliani. Friedman and Moss stayed resilient through the harassment and boldly testified before the January 6th Select Committee. Freeman and Moss also thumped Rudy Giuliani in the head for more than $148 million in a defamation suit in December 2023. These women have shown tremendous strength and courage. They have inspired me and pushed me to think about the historical bravery of the Black American woman. Documented many times, the Black American woman has proven she will rise to the occasion no matter how much adversity she faces. She has always played a pivotal role in American history, yet her recorded fearlessness and strength are under-acknowledged and unrecognized by the patriarchal society. In this video, we will spotlight Sojourner Truth, a legendary black American woman who rose from enslavement to become the symbol of a strong woman. Sojourner Truth, born Isabella, is one of two famous black American women of the 19th century. The other, Harriet Tubman, known as the Moses of her people, also emerged from enslavement. Born in 1797, Truth was a generation older than Tubman, born in 1821. Truth was a woman of extraordinary intelligence despite her illiteracy. Sojourner Truth was almost six feet tall and had a low voice that some said was masculine. She was an abolitionist and feminist who exposed the fact that the enslaved were not just men, but women as well. No other woman who experienced the ordeal of enslavement managed to survive with the strength and confidence to become a public presence long term. She went on speaking for years and traveled America criticizing slavery, women's rights, and women's suffrage. She was a Pentecostal, and through her religious beliefs, she transformed herself from Isabella to Sojourner Truth. Isabella was born an enslaved person in Ulster County, New York. We often forget that enslaved people existed in northern states and the southern states originally. Slavery was a vital part of northern life before 1800. The distribution of enslaved people across New York was widespread. Rural Dutch families, on average, would own one or two enslaved people. The main concentration of blacks was in New York City. Isabella was one of the rural black New Yorkers who spoke Dutch and learned to speak English fluently throughout her life. Her parents, James and Elizabeth, were the slaves of the Revolutionary War Colonel, Johannes Hardenberg. Her father, James, was known as Baumfree, meaning tree, and her mother, Elizabeth, was known as Betsy. Isabella was the youngest of 10 or 12 children. One of her earliest memories as a child was of her parents grieving over the loss of her siblings who became sold away. Her early years became filled with survivor's guilt and chronic depression. 
depression. The fear of the inevitable disaster of separation from family always lingered and eventually became a reality she would experience. James and Betsy were lent a cottage and allowed to grow and sell crops to pay for food and clothes. Unexpectedly, Colonel Hardenberg died and James and Betsy lost the cottage and the land. They all were moved to Hardenberg's son's, Charles' house, where they slept in the chilly, dark basement. After the death of Charles Hardenberg, nine-year-old Isabel went to an English-speaking family named Neely. Her parents were too old to convey any price and lived in a hut owned by the Simmons family. Her mother died suddenly, and her father lived in poor health for several years. He eventually perished, quote, chilled and starved, end quote, after traveling back and forth between different Hardenberg family members. Isabella said that her parents died, quote, ignorant, helpless, crushed in spirit, and weighed down by the hardship of cruel bereavement, end quote. Before she could grow up, Isabella had lost both her parents and 10 siblings. At the Neely's house, Isabella was inadequately clothed and suffered from the harsh winters. The Neely's could not speak Dutch and Isabella could not speak English. The language barrier made things worse and when Isabella did not understand commands, John Neely beat her severely. After a year and a half, Isabella became the property of the Shriver family. At age 12 or 13, Shriver sold Isabella to John Dumont for 70 pounds. Isabella lived with the Dumonts for 16 years and had an ambivalent attachment to them since she had known them longer than her parents. To the Dumonts, she was a daughter, servant, field laborer, and later a nurse. Isabella had five children. Her first child, Diana, was with Robert, her only romantic relationship. Romance and love were experiences rarely felt by working people in those days. Robert's owner was a man named Catlin, and he did not want Robert to have children outside of his property. He forbade Robert to see Isabella but he saw her anyway. When Catelyn found out, he beat Robert nearly to death for disobeying his wishes. Robert submitted and married one of Catelyn's females, but died shortly after due to injuries he received in the beating. Isabella married one of Dumont's slaves, Thomas, and had four children, Peter, Elizabeth, Thomas, and Sophia. Isabella wanted freedom for herself and her children, but the only free black people she knew were old and frail. She calculated the day of her freedom based on New York's Second Gradual Emancipation Act. The Second Gradual Emancipation Act, passed in 1817, stipulated that slavery would end within New York's borders on July 4th, 1827. Those born after 1799 still must serve a period of indentured servitude until age 28 if male and 25 if female. This law would keep her children in servitude well after 1827. Isabella struck a deal with Dumont to emancipate her a year before July 4th. 1827. Shortly after the agreement, Dumont reneged on his part after Isabella suffered a severe injury to her hand. Isabella had difficulty weighing Dumont's needs of finishing the six-month task of spinning wool into yarn or leaving a year before emancipation as they once agreed. In 1826, Isabella began moving towards embracing Methodism, but blended animist West African and pagan European beliefs with it. She finished the work in the late fall of 1826, 
Just as she heard the voice of God instructing her to set out on her own and be a free woman, she left the Dumonts, taking baby Sophia, and traveled to see her old friend, Levi Rowe. Rowe directed her to Isaac and Marie Van Wagenen, whom Isabella knew for years. Unlike the Dumonts, the Van Wagenens opposed slavery. When Dumont came for Isabella and Sophia, the Van Wagenens paid Dumont $25 for Isabella and $5 for Sophia. She lived with the Van Wagenens, taking on their name. She lived a quiet, peaceful life with whom she called, quote, excellent people for a year. In 1827, Isabella helped to found the Kingston Methodist Church. Isabella's heart lay in Pentecostal beliefs which emphasized the Holy Spirit. One day, Isabella inclined that Dumont would take her home and she would willingly return with him. Dumont arrived at the Van Wagenens in an open carriage and just before Isabella climbed inside the vehicle, God revealed himself to her. God showed her that he was all over the entire universe and there was no place that he was not. When Isabella regained consciousness, Dumont was gone. Isabella believed that she sinned for not believing in the almighty power of God and she began to fear God's wrath. She later had a vision of Jesus who assured her he loved her and would stand between herself and God's fury. Jesus's presence was liberating and put Isabella at ease. Isabella spoke on being baptized in the Holy Spirit and being born again with the assurance of salvation. The experience gave Isabella the strength to persevere under adversity and to overcome her feelings of worthlessness. She located a power that made it possible to survive. Her new ability to act with the support of an ever-present supernatural force gave her strength to overcome pain and fear. In the fall of 1826, John Dumont sold Isabella's son, Peter, to one of his in-laws, Dr. Gedney. Gedney sold Peter to his brother, Solomon Gedney, and Solomon sold him to his brother-in-law, an Alabama farmer named Fowler. Solomon Gedney was doing what most slave-holding New Yorkers did. He sold his slaves down south, where the market was lucrative. Isabella believed that God would help her rescue her son. She went to the Dumont, Gedney, and Warring families for help, but found they had no sympathy. She then went to God and said, quote, Oh God, make the people hear me. Don't let them turn me off without hearing and helping me, end quote. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, she acted and received advice and money for legal fees from the Ulster County Quakers. With the assistance of the Dutch lawyers, John Rutzer and Brian Hasbrook, Isabella entered a complaint with the Ulster County Grand Jury. She gave an assertive deposition in court and in 1828, she became the first black woman to have a legal victory against a white man. The judge declared that the, quote, boy be delivered into the hands of his mother, having no other master, no other controller, no other conductor, but his mother, end quote. When Peter returned home, his master brought him to see Isabella. When the child saw her, he shrieked. Peter experienced an immense amount of trauma since their separation. Isabella, clerks of the court, and several adults soothed Peter and assured him that Isabella was his mother. Isabella looked at her son closely and saw Peter's body covered in scars from head to toe. Isabella became infuriated and in vengeance and witchcraft she cursed the Fowler family. Shortly after, Isabella learned that Fowler had beaten Eliza Gedney Fowler 
to death. Isabella felt as if she received retributive justice by an act of God. Isabella was becoming torn between motherhood and ambition. She could stay in Ulster County with her daughters or go to the metropolis and seek well-paid work. In September 1828, Isabella and Peter moved to New York with Mr. and Mrs. Greer, who, like Isabella, were Methodist perfectionists. Mrs. Greer assisted Isabella with finding work in the homes of her friends, one of which, the La Tourette's, would influence Isabella's experiences in New York. The La Tourette's treated Isabella and Peter like family. They were Christians and were very religious and held religious meetings in their house. They recently left the Methodist Church because it was moving away from the ideals of John Wesley. James La Tourette created the Holy Club and their philosophy became known as New York Perfectionism. Perfectionists sought to eradicate corruption in the church and move towards a higher moral standard. Its origins lay in the Retrenchment Society, a prayer meeting for wealthy married women started by Francis Folger in 1825. They would visit prisons and pray with criminals and prostitutes in the poorest districts of the city. While living with the Le Tourette's, Isabella began preaching with them at the camp gatherings around the city. From 1829 through 1831, Isabella established herself as a powerful and moving preacher. She outpreached the competition and outdrew the renowned John Newland Maffitt. Maffitt was one of the 19th century's most charismatic preachers. Isabella's first appearance in the New York newspapers did not come because of her preaching, but rather her association with a religious commune headed by a wild-eyed man named Prophet Matthias. Isabella met Matthias through Elijah Pearson. His wife Sarah was a member of the Retrenchment Society. Elijah Pearson was a leader in the Holy Club and his influence peaked when he joined Arthur Tappan in establishing the Magdalene House of Refuge for poor and homeless women. Pearson became a religious fanatic and began to refer to himself as Elijah the Tishbite. He believed like the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament, 1 Kings 17, he was able to cure illness and resurrect the dead. When his wife died, he was unsuccessful at praying her back to life. Pearson separated from Le Tourette's Holy Club and started his church called the Members of Israel at Mount Carmel. Pearson asked Isabella about her baptism, and she told him she was, quote, baptized by the Holy Spirit, end quote. Pearson then concluded that Isabella and himself were kindred spirits. In May 1832, Isabella and Pearson received a visit from Robert Matthews. Matthews referred to himself as the Prophet Matthias. He combed his hair and beard in such a way as to look like Jesus. When Isabella met him at the door, she quoted Matthew chapter 10 and asked, quote, Art thou the Christ? Matthews replied, quote, I am, end quote. Then Isabella burst into tears and kissed his feet. Matthews had experience in using the Bible for his purposes. Matthews claimed that he was the spirit of truth. He wore a shiny black leather cone-shaped hat, a green dress coat lined with white or pink satin, a crimson silk sash around his waist, and highly polished Wellington boots. Matthias claimed the Holy Spirit spoke through him and 
warned about the end of days. Matthias convinced Pearson and Isabella of his divinity. James Latourette attempted to change Pearson and Isabella's minds about Matthias, but his efforts only encouraged them to embrace him further. In 1883, Matthias pulled Mr. and Mrs. Folgers into the group consisting of Pearson, Isabella, and others. In mid-1833, Pearson and Folgers put the 29-acre Westchester County estate and other properties in Matthias' name. The community consisted of men and women from different classes, with Isabella being the only one who was black. Matthias was called father, but did not see everyone as family. He gave orders to everyone and sat at the head of the table. He demanded that Isabella no longer preached because he considered it out of bounds for women. He beat Isabella for trying to intervene as he whipped one of his young sons. The household revolved around his power and he took Mrs. Folger as his match spirit. He married her and had a child with her. In exchange, Matthias offered his 18-year-old daughter to Mr. Folger. In 1834, Elijah Pearson died after a series of seizures. Pearson's death brought the Matthias cult under scrutiny by the press who picked up on the stories. The cult unraveled as Matthias found himself accused of murdering Pearson. The Folgers reconciled and returned to La Tourette, who scolded them for leaving. The Folgers gave Isabella $25 for wages and accused her of trying to poison them. Isabella took the Folgers to court and won $125 in damages, vindicating her reputation. In 1835, the Matthias trial was big news and generated a lot of press coverage. Isabella remained loyal to Matthias and testified on his behalf in court. She also continued to give him money and continued to grow the movement. Matthias eventually became incarcerated for four months for assault on his daughter and contempt of court. While in jail, New York City Theater ran a comedy called Matthias the Prophet. After his release, he traveled to Albany and met up with Isabella. Matthias went west by himself and did not allow Isabella to accompany him. This part of Sojourner's story is often left out because it does not match the heroine figure she became in the 1840s and 50s. We wrestle with the riddle of how could the woman who outpreached John Maffitt be beaten up, suppressed from preaching, have her money taken, and continue to be loyal to an abusive charlatan cult leader. She was attracted to the power Matthias held. He was brutal towards her, but like John Dumont, seemed to care for her. We must not forget, Isabella was only a few years out of slavery, and abuse felt like a genuine part of life. Isabella returned to New York City to rejoin her son Peter, who stayed there while she lived with the Matthias cult. Things changed in New York since Sojourner left. Her son found it hard to keep a job and became known as a troublemaker. Sojourner believed that he needed more schooling to interest him in work. One of her wealthy friends agreed to pay for his tuition. Peter cut classes to go dancing and got arrested for petty theft. The Reverend Peter Williams Jr. came to deal with young Peter, knowing what to do with troubled black youth. Peter Williams Jr. founded the first black newspaper in the U.S., the New York Freedom's Journal in 1827. Williams Jr. told Isabella he knew what to do with Peter to straighten him out. He arranged for Peter to join the legions of black men who found a better opportunity seafaring than in the city. Peter left for the sea to work, and it was the last time Sojourner saw her son. 
Isabella received letters from Peter with the last coming in September 1841. She never saw Peter again or ever found out what happened to him. In 1843, Isabella transformed herself into Sojourner Truth. Isabella appropriated the title Truth from her former spiritual leader, the prophet Matthias. The spirit of truth is also the paraclete, the Holy Spirit as conceived in the Gospel of John, who, sent by God the Father and Jesus the Son, comes to convince people of sins and judgment John chapter 16, verses 7 through 16. Isabella believed the Holy Spirit provided her with supernatural power and strength. The last name Truth designated her role as a preacher. In her narrative, she says that life in the city seemed to be a, quote, great drama, end quote, no more than, quote, one great system of robbery and wrong." End quote. She felt that she was not only a witness to the hardships of the city, but a contributor as well. It was clear to her that it was time to leave New York City. Like Lot in the book of Genesis, Isabella had to flee the wicked city. A sojourner is a traveler who is in someone else's home for a temporary stay. Isabella believed it was time for her to set on a pilgrimage to tell people to come to Jesus before the end of days. She believed that the world was ending soon and that we would witness the second coming of Jesus. With two York shillings and a pillowcase of belongings, she set out into the world as Sojourner Truth. When Truth left New York, it was during the height of the Millerism movement. Father William Miller was born in Washington County, New York in 1782. Washington is the same county where the prophet Matthias grew up. Miller's work closely paralleled his and may have inspired Matthews. Miller was a dispensationalist Dispensationalists made calculations when the end of time occurred based on the numbers cited in the book of Daniel. They believed they needed to convert as many people as possible before the end of time. Miller's exact apocalyptic dates were March 21st, 1843 and October 22nd, 1844. Father Miller's system of dating did not persuade Sojourner Truth. The Millerites welcomed her into their movement, but Truth was skeptical about joining them. An outburst of fanaticism convinced her that she was not a Millerite. The incident, known as the Stepney, Connecticut camp meeting, became infamous. At Stepney, John Starkwell whipped the crowd into a frenzy. He preached those who held the material things of the world could not be saved, and he singled out people as sealed for eternal damnation. People started to shed their symbols of vanity, whether clothing, jewelry, or false teeth. Sickened by the madness, Truth mounted a stump and called out, here, here, people began to gather around her. She addressed them as children and asked why they were carrying on so. Quote, are you not commanded to watch and pray? End quote. She demanded, quote, you are neither watching nor praying. End quote. She invited them back to their tents to pray quietly, quote, for the Lord would not come to such a scene of confusion. End quote. Millerites who heard her regained their composure. Millerite ministers admired her boldness and willingness to argue with them and contest their Christian knowledge. Truth saw God as an all-powerful, pervading spirit that spoke to her directly as a voice in her head or 
through the scripture. She considered the Bible to be a mixture of God's words and the ideas of those who had written it. Millerites recognized her views on divine revelation as, quote, one among the many proofs of her energy and independence of character, end quote. The Millerites guided truth to the Northampton Association for Education and Industry. The people of the Northampton Association were not Second Adventists calculating the end of days, but rather hoped the world would last long enough for them to rescue it from its barbarity. The community had two goals. First, to create a non-competitive, open-minded, intellectually stimulating place to live and work. Second, to make a profit from the manufacture of silk. When Truth met with the leaders of the Northampton Association, she said the sight of accomplished literary and refined persons living so simply suspended her negative judgments and led her to stay. No other place offered her the same, quote, liberty of thought and speech. The need to mend class conflicts and the abolition of slavery were their basic tenets. Frederick Douglass's first meeting with Truth occurred at Northampton. Douglass was irritated at her lack of sympathy for his journey and rebirth. While Douglass was schooling himself to, quote, speak and act like a person of cultivation and refinement, end quote, he said Truth, quote, seemed to feel it her duty to trip me up in my speeches and to ridicule my efforts, end quote. Douglas saw truth as a, quote, genuine specimen of the uncultured Negro who cared very little for the elegance of speech or refinement of manners, end quote. Through the condescension, Douglas understood what made truth successful. He said, quote, truth was a strange compound of wit and wisdom of wild enthusiasm and flint-like common sense." End quote. In the fall of 1844, Truth gave her first anti-slavery speech in Northampton. The Northampton Association dissolved in 1846. Truth began to yearn for a home of her own. The success of Frederick Douglass's 1845 biography, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, inspired her to dictate her own narrative. The proceeds from the book sales would be the way for her to purchase her home. Truth began dictating her autobiography to Olive Gilbert. It took three years to complete the biography. The narrative of Sojourner Truth remains outside of the genre of ex-slave narratives. It ends not with the indictment of the slaveholder, but with Christian forgiveness. The sale of the narrative was how she would pay off the mortgage for her new home. Truth took out a $300 mortgage and purchased a home on Park Street across from the cemetery. In 1854, she was discharged from the loan and finally owned her home free and clear. The Ohio Women's Rights Convention convened at Stone Church in Akron, Ohio on May 28, 1851. Presiding was Frances Dana Gage, a writer from McConnellsville, whose work appeared in the Saturday Visitor. Her rival, Jane Swisshelm, was also in attendance. They often disagreed with what women's rights were all about. Gage insisted on women's complete equality with men, while Swisshelm preferred to imagine a, quote, great law of nature, which says that he, the man, is the stronger and owes her, the woman, assistance, end quote. 
Swiss Helm and Gage also conflicted on whether the topics of slavery and race had a place in the movement and even whether African Americans were allowed in the meetings. Swiss Helm was not concerned about black women. Many other feminists spoke, but truth speech made the most impact. Her remarks fascinated the audience. Truth demanded rights for women based on their physical equality with men. She gave examples of how she did the same work in the field as the men while enslaved and belittled men who were perplexed by women demanding their rights. The fact that a woman can accomplish the same work as a man became a talking point still used today by feminists. Truth also cleverly used scripture to drive her point home. She encouraged them to look not in Genesis for the Bible's role for women, but in John and Luke for the stories of Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Jesus. Jesus respected women and took pity on two sisters who begged him to return their brother to life. Women's rights conventions provided a golden opportunity to sell the narrative. Truth remarked, quote, I sold a good many books at the convention and have thus far been greatly prospered, end quote. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act turned the entire nation into an enemy of black people. A slaveholder only needed to swear that a particular black person was his property and federally appointed commissioners and marshals could draft citizens to assist in the capture of enslaved people. Fugitives did not have the right to redress grievances or have a trial. President Millard Fillmore signed the act into law and blacks in the North discussed how they would respond. In Boston, Samuel Ringgold Ward announced that blacks no longer owed allegiance to the country. Robert Purvis, a freeborn black abolitionist, said, quote, Any wretch enter my dwelling, any pale faced specter among ye, to execute this law on me or mine, I'll seek his life, I'll shed his blood. Many rescues captured blacks like the one Harriet Tubman led in Troy, New York, occurred, some successful, some not. Thousands of blacks fled to Canada to escape the hopeless oppression of the United States. The agitated times inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe to write the 19th century's most famous work, Uncle Tom's Cabin or Life Among the Lowly. Truth lectured in a circuit that comprised nearly all white anti-slavery meetings to almost all white women's rights meetings. Her words were angry and she foresaw a time when blacks would get revenge against white people. Truth exclaimed, quote, the promises of scripture were all for the black people and God would recompense them for all their suffering in the world, end quote. In 1857, the Supreme Court declared Americans of African descent ineligible for citizenship due to the Dred Scott determination. In this hostile environment, Truth was still popular enough to convene a series of meetings in Indiana by herself. Her detractors knew her unique appeal was she was a formerly enslaved woman condemning the evils of slavery. In 1858, a group of white racists led by T.W. Strain challenged Truth's authenticity as a woman. They claimed her voice was that of a man's, denying the womanliness of a woman speaking in public is an old ploy. It is a challenge to a woman's authenticity. The charge polarized the meeting into a pro-slavery side that demanded Truth step down and show her breasts to the women in the audience who would report her gender. The anti-slavery side was surprised and upset, leading to an uproar. Truth responded brilliantly, shaming her questioners and attacked their manhood. Sojourner told them that her breasts had suckled many a white baby to the exclusion of her own offspring. 
that some of those white babies had grown to man's estate, that although they had suckled her colored breast, they were, in her estimation, far more manly than her persecutors appeared to be, and she quietly asked them as she disrobed her bosom if they too wished to suck. In vindication of her truthfulness, she told them that she would show her breast to the whole congregation and that it was not her shame that she uncovered her breast before them, but to their shame. An attack intended to be a degradation became a moment of triumph. Spiritualism fascinated many reformer Americans of the 1850s, Harriet Beecher Stowe among them. Spiritualists supported the abolition of slavery and women's rights. They called their meetings progressive friends or congressional friends. A tenet of spiritualism is hearing from the dead. Although Truth was skeptical about communicating with the dead, she joined the spiritualists and moved to the newly founded community of Harmonia. Truth sold the little house in Massachusetts and joined the racially mixed community of progressive friends. Details of why she moved from Northampton are unknown. In April 1863, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote an article in the Atlantic Monthly entitled, Sojourner Truth, the Libyan Sybil. Truth was a taken-for-granted figure who made rounds at various women's rights and anti-slavery meetings. Stowe begins by describing Truth's visit to Andover. She spins Truth's narrative and begins the story with Peter's sale and recovery. In Libyan Sybil, Stowe and her family appear as upper-class cultured people who appreciate Sojourner as a primitive object of art and a form of entertainment. Stowe turns truth into an out-of-date, harmless exotic who has little to say about slavery beyond the archives of her experience. Stowe's account of truth being deceased at the end of the Libyan Sybil was a falsity in addition to other details. Stowe finishes the essay by explaining how her interpretation of truth became depicted in a sculpture by William Wetmore Story. Stowe said that she told Wetmore about truth and the idea of truth, quote, worked in his mind and led him to the deep recesses of the African nature, end quote. When Stowe returned to Rome, Story made a clay model of what would become the Libyan Sibyl. The best known Libyan Sibyl is Michelangelo's, one of the five on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Story's Libyan Sibyl sits with a drape only covering her lap and legs. Her arms, breasts, and torso are bare. The sculpture is a woman of African descent who is partially clothed. William Story's companion, Cleopatra's statue, is covered completely. Mr. Story was an American, and he tried to avoid creating a look associated with the enslaved class. His Libyan Sybil was African, Libyan African. Out of the Libyan Sybil came another story called Frederick is God Dead? The account originated with Wendell Phillips, an abolitionist and close friend of Sojourner. According to Stowe, Quoting Phillips, Frederick Douglass spoke emphatically at the meeting in Boston's Faneuil Hall about how he lost faith that black Americans would ever get justice from white America. Douglass concluded that blacks must seize their freedom by force of arms. Quote, it must come to blood. They must fight for themselves and redeem themselves or it will never be done. End quote. Sojourner Truth was sitting in the front row. She rejected Douglas's logic and said, quote, Frederick, is God dead? End quote. Frederick, is God dead? And the Libyan Sybil elevated Truth's image dramatically. After Stowe's article, every mention of Truth identified her as the Libyan Sybil. Frederick, is God dead? 
May truth a symbol of the Christian faith and of nonviolence. In response to Stowe's exaggerated tales of truth, Francis Gage became inspired to create And Are Not a Woman. Gage decided to tell the story about Truth's intervention at the women's meeting in Akron, Ohio. She also wanted to set the record straight about Truth still being alive. Aren't I a Woman is a Francis Gage invention. This account by Gage is the story that contains the essence of what we think when we think of Truth today. Gage's account of Truth exceeds in drama and spectacular performance four times longer than the original 1851 account. We cannot know what Truth said in Akron, Ohio, but Gage's account is still compelling, but by no means the authentic Sojourner Truth. In the 1860s, Truth found a new way to reach supporters and raise money. The new craze of photographic carte de visite was sweeping the country. This form of photography was the invention of Frenchman André Adolphe Eugène de Stierdy in the mid-1850s. This form of photography allowed for infinite prints once the negatives became developed. The prints were mounted on cardstock and cut apart into four to eight photographs the size of visiting cards. Carte de visites of great men were popular with the masses, and they became handy for authors and politicians who publicly displayed them. Truth's carte de visites, along with others like Gordon, were circulated within the Union as anti-Confederate propaganda. The Civil War freed Truth from the simple Quaker-style dresses that she wore before. In Washington, Truth began to wear fashionable clothing. Truth's clothing was always of excellent quality, and while photographed, she presented the image of a respectable middle-class matron. In her 1864 studio photographs, she sits with a book, portrait, or knitting in her hands and a book and flowers on the table. Susan B. Anthony used a carte de visite of Truth standing with her disabled hand resting on her cane to raise money for the Women's Loyal League. In a letter to the Boston Commonwealth correcting Stowe's earlier statements, Truth enclosed six copies of her narrative and asked readers to purchase her photograph, back then called a shadow. Her regular caption became, quote, I sell the shadow to support the substance, Sojourner Truth. By circulating her photos widely, Truth claimed womanhood for women who experienced enslavement. The near absence of photographs of black women from this time makes Truth's photographs extremely valuable. Sojourner Truth once said, quote, if colored men get their rights and not colored women theirs, you see, the colored men will be masters over their women and it will be just as bad as before, end quote. Before the Civil War, Truth, Douglas, Stanton, Anthony, and their associates worked together against slavery, racial discrimination, and women's rights without seeing the causes contradicting. During the Civil War, the women's rights abolitionist community held together. The passing of the 13th Amendment ended the work of abolitionists and disagreements about who should vote first began to split them apart. In May 1866, Universal Suffrage supporters created the Equal Rights Association. Truth could not attend the founding meetings, but Francis Ellen Watkins Harper took the floor. Stanton and Anthony saw women's suffrage as a separate issue from race, and they did not like the idea of black men gaining voting rights before them. Harper disagreed with Stanton and Anthony, refusing to separate her gender from her race. Harper said that until white women acknowledged black women's predicament, she would dismiss women's suffrage as a whites only affair. Stanton and Anthony rejected the 14th Amendment because it introduced the word male into the Constitution for the first time. 
Truth justified it and defended the political rights of black men. White women needed to vote, but black women needed it even more because of limited education and lack of financially rewarding employment. Truth lowered the tension and calmed the meeting by playing the funny old woman. In 1867 and 1868, Stanton and Anthony further distanced themselves from the other abolitionists until they finally tore apart in 1869. The Equal Rights Association became divided into two new organizations. Stanton, Anthony, and others founded the National Women's Suffrage Association. The all-female NWSA turned its back on black suffrage and Reconstruction. Supporters of black suffrage and Reconstruction founded the American Women's Suffrage Association. The two groups went their separate ways for two years before reuniting in 1899 as the National American Women's Suffrage Association and adopting the Stanton Anthony ideology. Truth's final mission became advocating for the government to allow the newly freed people of Washington, D.C. land for resettlement in the West. Unemployed, impoverished, freed people still gathered in Washington in 1870. She believed government assistance was making the freed people lazy. She said, quote, when she saw able men and women taking dry bread from the government to keep from starving, she decided to devote herself to the cause of getting land for these people where they can work and earn their own living in the West. Truth modeled her plan for the resettlement of blacks after Native American reservations. Her government plans to allocate lands for blacks never manifested but migration was still in the works. In Louisiana and Tennessee, newly freed people were contemplating ways to resettle. The 1879 exodus to Kansas took tens of thousands of poor blacks out of Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and Tennessee. People left because of the fear of returning to slavery following the democratic recapture of the state governments. People like Henry Adams of Shreveport, Louisiana, became associated with the Exodus and testified to the U.S. Senate about it. In 1880, Truth went home to Battle Creek and became a local tourist attraction. She was the celebrated, quote, colored woman, end quote, of Battle Creek. In 1883, Truth was gravely ill and she passed away on November 26, 1883. Everyone, including Truth, believed she was 105 years old, but she was closer to 86. Her last words were, quote, be a follower of the Lord Jesus, end quote. In conclusion, Sojourner Truth's life story is a journey. She was born an enslaved person, but became a legend. A woman who faced the kind of abuse and hardship she faced should not have even had the strength to travel and speak for the amount of time that she did. She never let her past dictate her future. Truth is also one of the earliest examples of black Americans reinventing themselves around their faith to become reborn. We should also remember Truth for her impeccable moral character and wisdom. Being both black and a woman, it was always clear for her to see how women's rights and race were interrelated issues. She also used God and the Holy Spirit to lean on through the adversity she faced, similar to another civil rights activist who would come almost 100 years later in Martin Luther King Jr. Sojourner Truth has been ignorantly neglected by many, and I believe the time is now that we begin to celebrate the original strong black woman.